Good morning. Thank you to the uh, leadership and to each and every one of you for uh, this invitation to be here this morning to share something from uh, the Word of God with uh, all of us. Wow, this church got a lot of uh, resources. You got this uh, Dr. Kiru having this session for school leavers. Uh, that's really good. That's wonderful. I wish I had a Dr. Tiru like that when I left school. I would be in so, so much trouble, you know. I would go into the longkang and then crawl out and then fall into the longkang again. You know. So you have Dr. Tiru and then you got Jesus about to help us. You know. So school leavers are those who are going to college or going to form five or even, you know, whoever you are in school, you can come and don't have to wait to be a school leaver to come, you know. You can learn a lot of things while, while you, are, you are still in school. You know, so it's a fantastic resource. And then you got doctors, graduates here in the church. Uh, so many type of background. They were a lot of uh, and uh, enriching experiences and and wisdom. You know, to, to help one another here in the church uh, community. This is really great. Praise God. This morning, I like to share with us from the book of Ephesians. Uh, we will begin at Ephesians. One more stand. Can someone help me just with uh, one more stand here? Yeah, thank you. morning. Father, we just thank you for your presence here amongst us. We ask that, dear God, you will speak to us through your word, enlighten us by your spirit and the grace of God. We ask that you will so fill in each and every one of our hearts. We ask you to help us to understand your word, Lord, to speak to each of us by your spirit's voice. We pray that you bless this word, Lord, like arrows into every heart this morning. Direct it, Lord Jesus, with the light of your spirit, Lord, to fill us, to give us understanding, wisdom and knowledge of your word and of your ways, Lord. Bless this service, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. In the book of Ephesians, I hope uh, you are familiar with the book of Ephesians. It's uh, one of the most uh, solid epistles in the New Testament and uh, almost everything is there. But today I'd just like to cover very briefly a framework for our Christian life from the book of Ephesians. We won't really have time to go into a lot of details, but with this framework in mind, when you go back and read it, and it, it will help you to understand even the other New Testament letters. But this is a very, very important framework for our Christian life. It is something that God has for each of us. And these things that we are going to talk about today, they are non-negotiable. Alright? They are non-negotiable. Okay. First, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. In Ephesians chapter 2, I was carrying a you call that magnifying glass to read the Bible because my eyesight has changed, vision all have changed already. So I decided to make a pair of glasses. So embarrassing, carrying magnifying glass. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 5 tells us that, that God has made us alive together with Him. The moment we accepted Jesus into our life, Jesus made us alive by His Spirit. And then in verse 6, it says that He has, uh, and He not only made us alive together with Christ, alright, as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead by the power of Almighty God, 
and made Jesus Christ sit above, far above all principalities and powers, might and dominion, chapter 1, verse 21, at the right hand of God the Father, defeating all the powers of darkness. Alright, Christ defeated. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead has, in chapter 2, verse 6, also raised the Son together with Jesus. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead also has raised us up together with Christ Jesus and made us sit together in the heavenly places or in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual realm, in Christ Jesus. We are with Christ, we are in Christ Jesus. How did this happen? Through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. When we become Christians, Jesus, through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, comes and fills us, indwells us. We become born again. Suddenly our hearts, our eyes are enlightened, open. We suddenly uh, come to realize that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. He is our Lord and our Savior and He is the only God. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth and this universe and He came to offer us God's free gift of eternal salvation and eternal forgiveness of sins. All right. So Jesus came and did this. So this reality of the spiritual, the spiritual life, the heavenly places, has come inside our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's why, for example, during worship, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in each of our hearts, the Holy Spirit helps our heart, helps our mind, our soul, our senses to sense and feel the presence of God to be able to relate with God, to be able to connect with God. All right. So suddenly we are, we are brought into the reality of God's presence in each of our lives. All right. so, so He has made us to sit together with Him in the heavenly places. Now this is one very important metaphor. All right. Now the next, and then He says uh, in verse 10, chapter 2, For we are His workmanship, she had created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared uh, beforehand that we should walk in them. This church has got many, many, they are involved in many, many uh, good works that we should walk in them. So the word walk is first introduced here in chapter 2, verse 10. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, appeal to you to walk worthy of the calling. Chapter 4, Paul and expounds the word walk. Alright? Uh, we will come back to that afterwards. And then in chapter 6, in chapter 6, verse 11 and 14, verse 11, 13 and 14, Paul introduces the word stand. Alright? Paul, Paul says, Put on the whole armor of God, verse 11, chapter 6, that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the fiery darts of the devil. In verse 14, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the whole armor of God. So stand wearing the whole armor of God. So there are three important words in Ephesians. Chapter 2, sit. Chapter 4 and 5, walk. In chapter 5, uh, Paul says, in verse 2, walk in love. And in verse um, verse 8, he says, walk as children of light. And verse 15, he says, walk circumspectly. Walk carefully. Alright, walk. Chapter 4, chapter 5, Paul talks about the walk. Chapter 6, stand. So, Chapter 2, walk, uh, sorry, sit, walk, and stand. Now, Watchman Me wrote a book, or called, the title of the book is Sit, Walk, and Stand. But he forgot Malaysians love to eat. He forgot to put the word eat also. <laughs> so, sit, walk, and stand. Unfortunately, I didn't read the book. Or else I can truly some of his notes and give to us also this morning. But, today we're going to understand that this idea of sit, in chapter 2 verse 6 means this 
that Jesus, when we come to Christ, Christ has filled our hearts and brought us into a, the, a place of reconciliation with God the Father. All right? This is the only metaphor sit, where we are seated together with Christ and in Christ in the heavenly places. That means in the spiritual realm. That means in the spirit, through the spirit, we have now access to God. In chapter 1, uh, sorry, yeah. In chapter 2, verse 13, it says, We have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So, because of all the spiritual blessings mentioned in chapter 1, verse 3, the spiritual blessings are God's forgiveness, God's cleansing blood over all our sins. God has adopted us into His family as His own children. Alright? As, as His own children. We are not second class children in the family of God. And in the family of God, there is no biasness between men and women and whatever position, social position, economic positions we have in God. Because the same blood that brought you, 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 and you has brought us into the same place in Christ Jesus before God. So this position sit is a position whereby God has reconciled us to Himself. So it's a position of reconciliation. It is also at the same time a position of victory which Jesus Christ has uh, uh, Jesus Christ has won over the principalities and powers. It's a position of His authority and His victory and now we are in it and we sh share in this position of reconciliation, of victory, of His authority. But most importantly, in the position of reconciliation now, we are made numb with God, we are made right with God in this position. This We share in the same position that Jesus has with the Father, the closeness that Jesus has with the Father, we are in that place. You understand? We are in that place already. You and I are already in that place of the deepest, most perfect, most intimate, uh, intimate uh, union with God. It's a union with God. We are not just beside Him. We are inside Him. There's a union there with God. So Christ has accomplished this already. But experientially, we sometimes don't feel this. We don't feel and experience everything that Jesus Christ has done for us through, through the cross and through, his, uh, through the shedding of His blood. Because we have got sinfulness, weaknesses, lack of knowledge. We are not very disciplined with, in seeking God. So we have got many, many shortcomings, you see. And we have not diligently uh, cultivated this union with God and this communion with God. So we have to grow in this position. We have to grow it into its, its fullness, its reality. We have to grow in its uh, and experience what Christ has already done for us. For example, if we don't confess our sins before God, we cannot experience the forgiveness that God has already poured out upon us. In chapter 1, these are all spiritual blessings which uh, Paul mentions in chapter 1 verse 3. All right, And he says that uh, in verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. But how to experience it? The Bible says it. All right, this one sentence uh, is not just for 10 times forgiveness. It's eternal forgiveness. And so to experience it, we have to enter into a relationship with God daily and cultivate and practice this relationship and learn to grow confidently uh, in our relationship with this God whom we have. We don't know very well. We don't know very well. We have not experienced sin enough to know Him. 
I know Dr. Kwan because of my visits here in the church. But we are not best friends because we don't see each other every week, you see. Not like you. I've not cultivated that kind of closeness relationship with him like over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Like all of you have good friends, close friends because of you have cultivated, you have got taken time to know that person to up and down, up and down, difficult times, you know, misunderstandings and then you still come back and then you learn to forgive each other, you learn to receive each other's blessings and goodness so that friendship has developed and grown. So it's the same, exactly the same in our relationship with God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have to cultivate it. It doesn't happen automatically just by quoting Bible verses. Why? Because God is a person. Because God is a person and the Bible says that He has made, created us in His image. Meaning to say in His likeness, that means just as God is a person, you are also a person. And you you are proud of your identity as a person. Your personhood comes from where? The fact that God is a person, He's a being. Therefore, you are also a person and a being. You are you. Nobody can be you. They can try to imitate you, but they can never be you. There's only one you. He's not one Utama. What you? You. That is you. Cannot be duplicated or cannot be photostat. Cannot clone you also. The clone also is not exactly like you. You are the original copy. The clone is a copy. No matter how they make AI, they can never make you. Because you are created by God. So that's the big difference. So you have, you are created in the likeness of God. So your preciousness, you are invaluable. You are invaluable and priceless because you are created in the image of God. That word image of God is very hard to describe and explain. It's everything about you and as a human being. Your freedom, your own unique you-ness, identity, your gender, who you are as a person with all your unique personality traits. It's all created in the likeness of God. And because you are created in the likeness of God, therefore you as a human being can have a relationship with God as your maker, your father. Through Jesus Christ, uh, Paul in chapter 1 says, to God, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings to God the God of our Father, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father. So we share the same Father because of Jesus Christ. So we are now in the family of God. The songs we sang today and the communion we took that about the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is God's currency. It is God's way of buying you back claiming you, you are on, you and I are on the way to hell. Alright, we are lost. But through the shedding of God's blood, God has claimed you the moment you believe in Christ and made you completely His own. So He brought you first, paid the full price of your forgiveness eternally. He did all that for you first. Not slowly, you know. This one is not by installment. One shot is done. Not just for your 50 years of human existence, but for your eternal existence with God in heaven uh, unto eternity, infinitely. That's how powerful and how great uh, you can't even comprehend the fullness of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Through His death, His life, His resurrection, and His living inside us, now. So, because of, of that, you are priceless. You are worth more than the identity you, you and I want to get from our handphone. The latest this, the latest that, the most expensive shoes or the most expensive clothes. Some people find their identity in things. 
but your identity is so priceless that it is worth much, much more than the $10 million bungalow house that you are staying in. When you die, the bungalow house will not go with you. But you will go back to God. Your bungalow house will be burned by fire. Whatever identity you had with the bungalow house, it's gone. Smoke, ashes. So your identity cannot come from anything and anywhere else. Not even your position. Whether it's a tansri, datoship, elder, pastor, deacon, whatever it is. Your identity doesn't come from that. Not from your degrees, your education, whether theological or otherwise. Your success, the wealth that you make, how big and fat the bank account is, the identity doesn't come from that. Because your identity is very high. It comes from God. It comes from God. It's not use money to buy one. Not from hard work. So you are more than that, is it? So how do we live? But we tend to live in this false identity. How do we transfer li living from our false identity, from things, our background, education, earthly success and achievements, titles, etc. etc. Well, what people say about us, we, we, this is false. It's not our true identity. Is it? Our true identity is here in God, in Christ. How do we do this? We have to grow it inside us. We have to surrender and yield our heart, our whole being, our whole life, our trust, our will, our way of thinking, the old way of thinking, false identity. We have to trust and give it to Jesus because it's, it's a false thing. It's useless. It's, it's not worth anything in the eyes of... Because what God is giving us is of eternal in value and nature and substance. And it's solid. You ask yourself, if something can last forever and something that cannot last forever, which one is more solid? What is eternal is more solid. It's imperishable. It doesn't fade with time. You know. It grows more solid with time in God. How does all these things happen? You know? I want to share with us the most important thing in the Christian life. The most important thing in the Christian life. For all these things that Paul talks about, to grow inside you as a reality, as something solid inside you, you and I have to enter into a daily relationship with Jesus and learn to cultivate it. If you know how to boil hot water, if you know how to cook rice uh, and you know how to eat rice, you can do it. You go and more they six six fun get more they hot you hot. I grew up in a Chinese family, uh, so my auntie uh, Morgan Tai, uh, you know, when we all grow up at primary school, uh, we all very lazy one. They ask us to do things we say cannot do, like give excuses. The first thing my auntie will they six six fun no? <laughs> Chinese family like that one. You know how to eat rice or not? So everything you say cannot do, cannot clean the bed, cannot clean the toilet, cannot cook rice, don't know how to boil water. You know how to eat rice or not? That's how we educate you, children. Unfortunately, modern families don't, don't do this because they got kaka. Kaka, do everything. So you have to cultivate it. Alright? That's why Paul says uh, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead in Japan has now also raised you up together with him and made you to sit together with him in a perfectly, infinitely reconciled position with God, our Father, who, who is not only in heaven, but in our hearts, and who is relatable as a person who is personal to us. That's another thing about being a person. You're not only a person, because you are a person, you desire, you can become personal. People are lonely because they don't have personal, intimate relationship with someone whom they can trust. 
when two or three people know how to share their personal struggles, problems with one another, confidentially, not no leakage, you know, they find, they discover intimate relationship. That's what fellowship is all about. Fellowship is not fellowship, makan ini, you know. Fellowship is of the spirit, it's something genuine, something sincere, it's not malicious. So, so we have to cultivate this relationship. Now, in the book of Ephesians, your in cultivating your intimate position with God is tied in with your walk. Chapter 4, chapter 5. It's tied in with chapter 6. Stand. Ability to stand against the walls of the devil. Where Paul says uh, in chapter 6, verse 10, uh, Finally, my brethren, uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In the power of his might. Where does the power of his might come from? Chapter 2, verse 6. Be strong in your communion with God to cultivate your relationship with God and then you will be strong in the power of his might. So our position of union with God is the most important position in this universe. It's the most significant, it's the most powerful uh, position that God has given us. This position of union with God, whereby we have intimate access to God. Intimate access to God. We can experience this union, the reality of this union, this closeness with God's presence. The closeness with his being. We can experience his forgiveness and his love for us. His presence is not only in us, but he's with us. He's walking with us through life. We can experience it in no other way but by learning to cultivate it. That's why our prayer life, our devotional life, is the most important thing in your Christian life. It's not ministry to the elder. If you don't have a communion relationship with God, your ministry uh, is useless. It's to your money. You are trying to impress God with your service. But in His presence, the place of intimacy, you and I are absent. The chair is empty. <coughs> We are not seeking His face. And yet we want to do His work. Now God is not impressed uh, with that kind of ministry. That kind of ministry doesn't impress God. It's not ministry, in fact. It's your ministry, but it's not God's ministry. Many Christians are doing uh, their own ministry. You know. They are ministries. It's not God's ministry because it is not spirit empowered. It's not dependent upon God through cultivating the daily intimate union, communion, relationship, closeness with God. So that as we come before God, He comes before us. He fills us. He gives us the grace. He gives us the love. He gives us the, His Spirit so that by His Spirit we go and serve others. We don't serve others by our action. Now, our Asian Chinese way of thinking, action, zhou, is more important. But in the Christian, is zhou is second. Doing is the second part. The being part is the relational, the relational relationship with God, cultivating this. This is the center of everything else in your Christian life. So the position of sin, communion with God, cultivating this work of reconciliation that Jesus has already done for us, chapter 1 Ephesians, that is the background to sin. Because of what he has done, we have now to grow in it. 
grow into its fullness that's already been given. This position sit co-inheres, co-exists, it co-indwells the walk and the stands. So the sit, walk and stand, they are not three separate mutually exclusive uh, metaphors or actions. They are mutually uh, inclusive. So imagine the stand, the walk, the sit, they indwell each other inside. They are living inside the sit. Meaning to say that the way I relate with God, the way I'm cultivating, growing in my relationship with God will directly affect my walk. Walk is a word that Paul uses to describe our behavior, our conduct, our attitude, the way we relate with people, the way we treat people, the way we do our work for our bosses, the way we serve, do ministry, whatever it is, or even housework, whatever it is. So the, our relationship with God affects the way we walk. So if our relationship with God is not good, is not enriching to me, doesn't help me, doesn't change me, I'm not experiencing God, I'm not finding His reality, His presence, His grace, His forgiveness, His spirit, I'm not hearing Him, then my conduct, my behavior as a Christian from inside out and not outside in, from inside out will be affected, it's in jeopardy. Now we can, it's in jeopardy, that means it can be a form only. But there's no spiritual substance because there's no intimate communion with God inside the walk. So the walk, the conduct is dead. Is disempowered. So this intimate communion with God affects our walk, affects our relationship with people. It affects our the way we do our work, the way we serve God. It affects the way we relate with each other. It affects the way we relate with people who are different races, different background, different standing. The way we relate and treat foreign workers. The way we treat foreigners who are working for us. Foreigners who are in our midst. So our relationship with God affects all these things. It colors it. So if the relationship with God is genuine and pure, the way we treat people will be seen. So it will not be double standards. We will not be so hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then the way we treat people, give people one kind look. And if they are foreigner, we look down on them somehow. So you won't see this. That's why your relationship with God determines, shapes your conduct, your relationship with God. So you cannot tipu God. Now, this communion with God also affects our stand against the wiles of the devil. So this book of Ephesians chapter 6, tells us this, we cannot have the attitude of that uh, devil, I leave you alone and you leave me alone. You don't catch on me and I don't catch on you. You cannot. You can make peace with him, uh, but here Jesus said uh, is a thief uh, who comes uh, to steal, uh, to kill uh, and to destroy you. So if you ignore him, that's the worst thing to do. Because like it or not, he's dead. So chapter 6, about many people quote this for spiritual warfare. Yes, it's spiritual warfare. It's not for intercessors only. It's for the whole church. Because Paul is writing to husband, wives, fathers, children, masters, slaves. You read in chapter 5. So chapter 6, uh, when Paul says, put on the whole armour of God, the whole armour of God, each of the piece of armour is a summary uh, of everything that Paul has been talking about from chapter 1 to chapter 6, verse 9. Put on, therefore, put on the whole armour of God, is a summary. 
So your intimate communion with God, your intimate communion with God is like likened to your breastplate. Because the breastplate protects your chest, your heart. So in our relationship with God each day, we have to deal with the heart. The condition, the spiritual condition of the heart. Right? So, one thing you must be clear. All of us, as far as God is concerned, the most selfish in the universe, we can win an Oscar every day for being the most selfish person in the world, in the universe. You know? Since the beginning of time up to now, all of us will win the Oscar every day. There's nothing good in us. So no matter how thorough you think you are, because of what you have done in the past or what you are doing now, you cannot hide it from God. Before you do it, God already knows. Is he affected? He's not affected. Nothing moves him. He is the first cause unmovable. Cannot be moved. The heavens and earth can shake, but God is not moved. He's not moved by Putin. He's not moved by the war in Ukraine. He's not moved by the turmoil in the earth. You read the Psalms, the earth shakes, but the earth, but the Lord reigns. So his position is immovable. That's the God that we are putting our trust in. But we have to cultivate it for that revelation of who God is inside you and with you and around you. The only place to cultivate and make this reality an existential reality. Something experiential, something that you know deep inside your heart is through cultivating a very intimate union with God. Because as you do so, the Holy Spirit will give you the revelation and the insight and will make it so real inside you that you don't even have the words to describe it. But it's, it's something real. It's as, for example, as real as Jesus is inside you, you don't have all the words enough to describe this reality. And so this place of intimate union means this for it to grow it must it is the most important thing in your whole life as a person now this relationship of union with god it says in the heavenly places in christ that means in the spiritual realm it's true the holy spirit because the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead has the same spirit has put you there. So it's true the action of the Holy Spirit. But we don't often feel it as something real. Alright? Because we have to cultivate it. So the presence of God is like this. After you have a good worship, a good prayer time, even, or you may have get God slain because somebody prayed for you. The next day you wake up, it's like normal again. But it doesn't mean that what has happened the day before is not something real. So, our human existence is like this. Our spiritual life is such that we need the infilling of the spirit afresh each day. We need to touch God each day anew. So the less often you spend your time with God, the drier your Christian life will become. You'll, you will become more distant in the way you think about God or spiritual things. Because our human nature is such, it is totally depraved. Because of sin, the damage, the effects of sin inside us. 
So much so that we are naturally and intrinsically curved into ourselves and deeply selfish. Deeply. All of us, me, also like this. So it's, th- it's going to take an eternal process for God to turn us towards Him. To turn us His way and to change the way we think and to diminish this self-centeredness in us. To diminish it. Martin Luther says, uh, he's a great, fantastic uh, theologian. I just come to realize he's made this important statement. He says uh, that we are so deeply sinful uh, that so deeply sinful and so cunning uh, that we will even use God and use ministry and use the things that God has given us uh, and blessed us with uh, to gratify ourselves, to please ourselves, to make ourselves look good. And you find Paul describes this uh, in chapter 4, uh, verse 17 onwards. Where he says uh, that, verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct. The old man which grows corrupt, uh, the old man here is not our human father. Which grows corrupt according uh, to the deceitful lust. This word deceitful lust means uh, in the Greek, it means deceptive desires. It's so ingrained inside us. For example, we've all experienced this once, one time or before. When we want some, something so badly, we will find all the excuses and all the reasons to justify ourselves to have that thing, to go that way, to make that decision. Only to discover that it was a wrong decision. It was a wrong thing to do. And to regret later. But in the beginning, we are so self-deceived. That's how corrupted sin has made us. So there's a, a nature, a, our, our self-nature, self-being is such that if we are not in relationship with God and allowing God to speak to us in our hearts through His Word, we are not surrendering to Him and allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us each day, to lead us as we yield and surrender our lives to Him so that He is in the process of changing us uh, deep within. If we, if we live alone and separate ourselves from, from, from all that, our self-nature is such that it will grow corrupt every day. It is corrupting us. It is destroying us. It is not transforming us. But outwardly, we can behave like a Christian. Outwardly, we can be doing many, many things. Also, but inwardly, in a penetrating way, the change is not taking place. Let me close with this. Just, alright, I'll close with this. Okay, I can see lunch pack flying around in the air. Really. <laughs> All the dim sum and the tose and the, <laughs> the chicken parada all flying in the air. Okay, I can see. Okay, I also got one over here. So, so when Paul talks about this position of the most intimate union with God, it's not so mystical that it is detached from human reality. Because in chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 3, Paul immediately in chapter 4, he grounds this intimate union and communion with God. He grounds it into our daily life, daily living, our daily walk with God. He says, uh, to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness, all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In chapter 4, at the end, further down, he says uh, in verse 31, 32, Let all bitterness, wrath, clamour, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ 
forgive you. These spiritual virtues or the fruit of the Spirit are mentioned throughout chapter 4 and chapter 5 and chapter 6. Now these virtues are, take one, chapter 4 verse 2, he says, Walk worthy with all lowliness, gentleness, kindness, tender-heartedness, forgiving one another, walk in love, chapter 5. These qualities are, are these qualities are not natural human qualities. These qualities are, are counter-intuitive, counter-cultural uh, to our human natures. These qualities are, are produced only by and through uh, the work of the Spirit. So one of the signs that our chapter 2 verse 6, communion, intimate communion, good prayer life, closeness with God, experiencing His presence and glory, one of the signs that is uh, uh, that shows that we, we have this communion uh, is seen in chapter 4 verse 1 to 3 there is lowliness there's humility the humility is the evidence that the relationship with god is something good it's a bona fide relationship it's a it's something that is genuine it's a genuine article loneliness is another word for humility now we must understand that uh, in the Greco-Roman world, during the time when the Bible was written, Paul's time, humility is not a virtue. The Romans and the Greeks see humility as something to, to be shunned, to be avoided. It's something despicable. To see a person humble, it doesn't attract them. You know, it's not a virtue. So if you live in a culture that does that despises humility, that despises lowliness, weakness, gentleness, duty, they despise all these things and you live in a culture that is like this. And this is a high quality, it's a high virtue in God's nature and character because Philippians 2 verse 5 to 8 tells us that Christ humbled himself and became human. He humbled himself and became human. Are you and I are willing to discard our race? And God put a different color skin on you, which you really don't like. Because his is divinity, divine nature, eternal in nature. He put on corruptible human nature that is susceptible to sin, can be tempted. That's a very big distance. He became so low. He became so low. Sinful natures, human being. Why must God, who is so eternal and glorious and holy and so perfect, He has everything. He doesn't even need us. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need this world. Why must he give that up and come all the way down? So low that uh, he got no class. Although he got no class yet, uh, he had all the class in the world. But he doesn't belong to any class, any social classes. So this aspect of Christ's humility teaches us this, uh, that in the eyes of God, our human nature is such, we are all very class conscious. We want people to know that I got the latest this. I belong to second middle class. I stay in this place. I drive this kind of a car. My children go to this kind of college, get this kind of We are very conscious and we are so scared. We want to impress people so that people don't look down on us. But in the eyes of God, Jesus has no class. How many of us want to be like him? Conform to his likeness. He is not, he's got no class, no social, he doesn't want to belong to any human category. He's lowly, riding, he's coming into Jerusalem. Zechariah 9, verse 9 says, He's right, he come, he's so lowly, riding on a donkey. It's not even a Mercedes donkey, not even a Kanchil donkey. It's not a warrior horse. It's not a stallion. It is not a general's horse. 
is the donkey, lowly. Lowly meaning uh, he so identified with the lowest in the society. The lowest are the poor, the voiceless, the weak, those who got no social class, the most despised, they can identify with him. That is Jesus' class. So with all lowliness, is counter-cultural. How to cultivate this virtue? It has to come uh, to die, to giving up our false thinking. You read chapter 4 verse 17 onwards, go back, your homework. This old way of thinking uh, has to be put off. You have to put it off, you see. And so this new way, this count new, this is the new creation that Paul talks about, God, the Bible talks about. This is the new creation, all loneliness. The virtues, uh, these virtues, this ground, these virtues of humility, gentleness, forgiveness, long suffering are actually uh, the very ground uh, for exaltation. They are the very ground and the reason that God promotes us, glorifies us. He glorifies us through the ground of humility. Not your spiritual gift, not through your talents. It's through the being like Jesus. Not because there's no self-aggrandizement. There's no desire to impress anybody. Because it's totally selfless. It's just humble before God. Nothing for yourself, nothing for me. And so this communion with God is totally grounded. In fact, the weapons of our warfare against the devil are the spiritual virtues. In chapter 4 and chapter 5. These are your weapons. Because of these virtues, you read chapter 4, chapter 5. I hope Dr. Paul will give you a test next week. List down at least 10 virtues. Mention them from chapter 4 to chapter 5 and 6. What are they? These virtues are your weapons. Because of these virtues, when you stand against the enemy, when you stand against the enemy, the power of God flows through you. The weapon of God, the authority and the power of God flows through you. Because God sees himself in you. The qualities that are in God are resident in us. That gives us power. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Okay.